Good morning once again. The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This morning our gospel lesson comes to us from the gospel according to St. John chapter 21. And we will read and hear together verses 1 through 19. That's John 21, 1 through 19. And if you'd like to follow along, you can find this reading on New Testament page 109 in your pew Bible. John 21, 1 through 19. And here is what it says. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the most spiritually formative experiences of my life was the walk to Emmaus. I don't know how many folks here know what I'm talking about, but for those who have never heard of it, Emmaus is a 72-hour retreat designed by the Upper Room to deepen participants' relationship with God through cutting off distractions, through immersion in worship, through connection in fellowship, and through engagement in reflective study. 
I actually went on my walk in 2007. But it was just three years ago that I was blessed to serve as an assistant spiritual director for the Purchase Area Gathering. Now, part of the duties of the assistant spiritual director is to attend the send-off or the opening service that typically takes place on a Thursday evening. And it was a privilege to be there and to see some familiar faces and to meet some new folks, to bear witness to both the excitement and the apprehension palpable among the pilgrims. Because the first night is always a little bit anxious. You're out of your comfort zone. You're, you're not sure what to expect. You've been asked to turn in your wristwatch, to turn in your cell phone, and you're going away for 72 hours, kind of blindly. It's a little bit nerve-wracking. And to top it all off, you're in very close proximity to a bunch of other folks, many of whom are strangers. That's why one of the first things that's done is an activity called My New Best Friend. In it, each pilgrim pairs up with whomever they happen to be sitting next to. And they share their name and some family information and where they attend worship, an interesting fact about themselves. Then, when it's your turn, the person with whom you shared introduces you and you introduce them to the rest of the group. As we went around the room that night, meeting everyone's new best friend, we learned about one another. Putting names to faces and hearing snippets of people's stories that we might better understand where they were coming from. Anyway, we reached the end of the table at which I was sitting, and a pair of men stood to introduce each other. The first told his new best friend's name, told about his family and where he held church membership, all pretty standard. But then he shared the man's interesting fact, telling us that he's a recovering drug addict. But what happened next was impossible to predict. Because the man who was just introduced stood and began to share about his new best friend and when he concluded, revealed that he too is a recovering drug addict. Now these men hadn't been paired up by the team. Their conversation had not been arranged. They just happened in that room of 35 or 40 people to sit next to each other. But as they shared their stories, they found that common ground, a starting place. A space to build relationship. And from my perspective, they received a sign that God is the gracious giver of new days. God is the giver of new day. And this was good news for those who first followed Jesus because as we have been hearing the last couple of weeks, they got it wrong a lot, didn't they? The disciples pretty regularly missed the point, stumbled in their fidelity. Even those who seemed the most faithful at times, they spoke out of turn. They acted hastily. They were, to sum it up, very human. Even so, Christ isn't quick to cut them off. Instead, as we see in this morning's gospel text, he sets a table for them. Metaphorically, of course. He's actually built a fire. But the imagery is similar. He invites them to come, to sit, to rest. To take a load off. To eat. And to be filled. And it seems like a pretty quiet meal. Pretty low key. St. John doesn't record any words being spoken while they ate. So it was nothing like Thanksgiving at our house. But as they finish, Jesus breaks the silence. Turning to St. Peter, he asks this. Do you love me more than these? More than what? <laughs> More than 
this fish that we're chowing down on? More than the other disciples? More than whatever for him represented life or, or, or security or safety? We don't know, but nonetheless, Peter replies, Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Even so, Jesus asks him twice more, do you love me? And twice more, Peter answers in the affirmative, even becoming a little bit agitated at the questioning. But you know, I don't believe it's merely the fact that Jesus is asking these things that bothers the apostle. I think it's that he has an idea of why Jesus is asking Because it had only been a few days prior that Peter had been questioned, not by Jesus, but by people outside the high priest's house regarding his relationship with Jesus. You're one of that guy's followers, aren't you? I've seen you with him. Peter answers, I'm not. Not once, not twice, but three times, even denying that he knew who Jesus was at all. And now, as they sit together, Jesus asks, not once, not twice, but three times, whether or not Peter loves him. But understand, Jesus asks these questions not to belittle Peter, not to make Peter feel poorly about himself. Rather, our Lord's giving him another opportunity. Another chance. A chance, perhaps, to respond the way that he should have responded before. But even more than this, Jesus is reminding Peter that even though he had failed even though he had failed. He isn't finished. Jesus still has an assignment for Peter. Take care of my sheep. Feed them. Tend them. Protect them. Look after them. Peter, lead them. All this for one who had blown it pretty badly. And not because he deserved the new day, but because God is gracious and is the giver of new days. You know, St. Paul needed a new day as well. As we catch up with him in today's lesson from the book of Acts, we meet him prior to his suffering for the faith, prior to his composing the majority of the New Testament, prior to his being among the greatest evangelists in the early church, even prior to his being known as Paul. Now here he is Saul, a pious, upright, well-educated Jewish man who sought to live according to God's law, according to God's will, and, and, and to do what God expected of him. But part of that, in his mind, was destroying the church. Helping to capture and kill Christians. To stamp out this, this rogue sect of Judaism that was corrupting the people and, and, and polluting the religious waters of the day. Indeed, Scripture records that Saul was present at the death of the first Christian martyr, St. Stephen, and that he approved of his stoning. In short, Saul was going in the exact opposite direction that God wanted, and yet firmly believed. Listen, folks, Saul firmly believed that he was doing what was right. That he had God's seal of approval. His new day came on the road to Damascus. When a blinding light from heaven knocked him to the ground, it was there that our friend Saul met Jesus. It's there that things changed for Saul. He became Paul and was helped by God to realize how blind to the truth he'd actually been. 
And when the scales finally fell from his eyes, he began to preach a new gospel. A gospel not of hate, but of love. Not of exclusion, but of inclusion. Not of enmity, but of peace. In short, he began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I had someone ask me not long ago whether I play golf. I don't, but I do fancy myself to be the Arnold Palmer of putt-putt. Um, Christy's actually pretty good, too. She's beat me on a few occasions. but Occasionally, we still have trouble with some of the courses in Gatlinburg. There are a few fairly complex games in that town. So complex, in fact, that it isn't unheard of for us to need a mulligan. If you know what that is, it's a do-over. The thing is, in life, there aren't many situations in which we are handed do-overs. There aren't many situations in which we are given a reset button. That's just not the way the world works. Often when we miss opportunities, they're just missed. They're just gone. And we don't see them again. And often when we make mistakes, anyone here ever made one? Often when we make mistakes, we just kind of have to live with them. Deal with the consequences. And hope that we can learn to do better the next time. But it's for these reasons that I'm unspeakably grateful. That even though the world might not give us do-overs, God is the gracious giver of new days. I'm grateful that God gives new starts. That God allows second chances. I've needed them and third and fourth and so on. I'm grateful that God's love is deep enough, that God's mercy is wide enough for me to acknowledge my sins, yet rest assured that God has not tossed me aside. And that God isn't finished with me. I'm grateful that neither my pride nor my prejudice, nor all the things I do that I shouldn't, or the things I should do that I don't, none of that, none of it, can outweigh God's affection for me or for you. So how about it? Do you need a new day? A new beginning? A do-over? A mulligan? Obviously, I, I can't read your heart. I can't read your mind. I... I don't know the secrets, the hidden blemishes of every life here. I don't know exactly what you're struggling with or the details of the hurts that have left you scarred. I don't even know the whole weight of the guilt you carry or those things that cause you to to quiver with anxiety or fear. But I do know one who invites you, who invites us to a new day. I know one who invites us to come and to rest in the divine presence. I know one who welcomes us to put our whole trust in grace. One who is well aware of where we've been, of what we've done, of who we are. And loves us anyway. May we therefore offer ourselves to God. Seeking the strength and guidance of the Spirit to navigate this day. Doing our best with the time we've been given to follow Christ. To reflect God's image and to give God glory. And in the times wherein we fall short. May we not lose heart but hold rather to the promise of newness, a new creation. 
a new hope, a new day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.